Welcome to Email After Hours by Senderscore, powered by Validity. We're your hosts. My name is Guy Hansen. And I'm Danielle Gallant, and this is Email After Hours. Here on Email After Hours, we love an international perspective, particularly when a region achieves high inbox placement, low bounce rates, and exceptional customer engagement. So today, we are going to focus on Germany. The average German sender sees more than 97% of their marketing emails land in subscribers' inboxes. That is way above the global benchmark at about 85%. So this begs the question, what do German senders know that the rest of us could learn from? And to help us break this question down, we're sitting down today with two of the sharpest minds at Digital, a Munich-based agency. And a real pleasure to welcome Carlos Ariel Jeffrias, the head of marketing cloud at Digital, and Marcus Deng, who is Digital's head of marketing unit and senior solution architect. And just for a little bit of context, Digital has a strong client base specifically in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, the Dash region, and is currently one of the leaders in the digital transformation and digital cloud experience space. Welcome to the show, Carlos and Marcus. Such a pleasure to have you guys here with us today on Email After Hours. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot, Guy. As we mentioned in the intro, Germany is one of the highest performing individual countries in terms of certainly in terms of inbox placement, which is one of the lenses that we at Validity view email performance through. And in our most recent email deliverability benchmark report, it showed that nearly 98% inbox placement for the region. So let's start by giving our listeners a better understanding of how German senders achieve this enviable metric. Yeah, at a top level, why do you think German senders perform so far above the global benchmark. I mean, definitely regulations are a part of it because even before GDPR and the high fines were introduced, there were already a lot of legal requirements regarding commercial communication and they are still in place on top of GDPR. So how I perceive it is that the German companies are a bit more risk averse than than maybe others in the market. And that's why they often implement the, the strictest interpretation of the regulations and This leads to definitely a high quality of the email list, maybe a little bit lower quantity than than other markets, but this this could all help because with all of those measures in place, there's a very high likelihood that all of the subscribers that are remaining who are real true subscribers also have a genuine interest in in the emails that they receive. And yeah, therefore the engagement is is higher. And as we all know, this will definitely have a, a great advantage for most email providers. Yeah. And maybe another secret to keep that clean, even if you have a high volume of, of sense and you're operating globally, is having a proper IP strategy in place to really focus on what you do with which market and where you should better use a, a separate IP. And as a natural sort of follow up to that question, Marcus, you mentioned engagement, right? So naturally, the way that subscribers engage with email is a major factor in whether or not messages are going to reach the inbox. So we have high inbox placement rates, and we have high engagement rates. But outside of maybe risk aversion and and list hygiene, why do you think German subscribers are so engaged and so interested? Are there strategies that are employed by marketers in the region to foster those positive subscriber sentiments? I mean, definitely. So there is widespread measures like the the double opt-in, which really keeps it clean and you really limit or target better in the market. But I mean, if you really want to subscribe to something and you know that your email address isn't misused or yeah, that, that you have any benefits, the widespread of the measures like double opt-in and sending based on a contractual relationship already limits the audience that senders in the market target. But it also increases the likelihood that someone is genuinely interested in the company's communication and therefore also the engagement. But on top of that, the audience is not just an email address to them because they really know something about it. They have the chance to really tailor the program to the needs of the subscribers and create more personalized uh, content and really targeted segments, which also, of course, increases the the engagements and the, the positive sentiment towards an email program. But it 
is not only that marketers do it voluntarily, because for emails sent based on this contractual relationship, you have to base the content related to the services or the products that are within the scope of the contract. So this really forces companies to send targeted information. So it's not only that they are so advanced in their email programs that they really design targeted communication and use dynamic content, but they basically have to in order to to increase the list size and not only get the ones who yeah, really actively sign up for the email programs, for example. That was a really interesting comment you just made, Marcus. And as an aside, I attended the CSA summit in uh, Cologne recently, and they were talking exactly about how tightly German senders are constrained in terms of only being able to send content that's aligned with what's being consented for. And they were saying, for example, that if you bought a bicycle, it might be okay to receive marketing communications for a bicycle bell or a new saddle. But bicycle holidays would probably be regarded as too far away from that initial consent. So it's a very, very high definition. Carlos, let's bring you into the conversation. Marcus touched on double opt-in, and I feel like it's a common misconception that double opt-in is just an absolute requirement for German senders. And I think the reality is that while double opt-in isn't necessarily an explicit legal requirement, there are already multiple court judgments stating that only double opt-in provides absolute proof that consent has been provided. And that's why it's widely adopted in Germany. But there's definitely benefits for email senders as well. So I guess my question to you is, you know, what are the benefits of using double opt-in as the mechanism for consent in terms of maintaining a clean and highly engaged email list? For sure, double opt-in increases the level of engagement of, of your audience and this. You're basically as a marketing addressing customers that are already familiar with your brand and services. Also decreases the number of complaints that may be related to a marketing campaigns where not opting was confirmed. So some clients may be confused about the nature of the email. Why do I receive this communication and not? This usually does not happen with a double opt-in. Also, in terms of IP reputation or spam complaints, it has a very positive uh, side effect as well. And uh, for marketers in the end, uh, it gives the opportunity to, to set the right expectations in the audience from the very beginning. So if you are in the position to start your, your welcome programs, your, you know, the first touch points of the journey with a highly engaged audience. And so there are, of course, a very positive effects of operating on a double opt-in basis. And I'm, I'm based in Canada, where the perspective on double opt-in is similar to the way it is in Germany. But I'm thinking about regions like the U.S., where double opt-in is far less prevalent and spam folder placement is much higher. And maybe this is a selfish question, and I want you to <laughs> say this loud and clearly, or what I think you're going to say, for all of the senders and clients that I work with who are based in the U.S., but do you think that double opt-in should just be more widely adopted given its clear benefits? In my opinion, of course, there are different different markets, different ways to, to run marketing campaigns, different also customer expectations now in terms of communication. But my experience is that double opt-in also brings you in the direction of improving the client experience. Being transparent about the nature of the communication, giving your audience the opportunity to understand why do they receive those emails or something else, or they understand the value of the email program is for me a very clear benefit of the double opt-in process. Downside, of course, you may lose some some subscribers that they may not confirm their subscription or registration. And of course, this could have a certain impact, some markets and some, some industries. But if those confirmation emails are basically managed and trigger following best practice, usually we see a confirmation rate above 90%. Wow. So all in one, I think the benefits of having a double loading process are more than the downside effects of losing some potential subscribers. There we go. Is that the answer you were hoping for, Daniel? That is exactly the answer I was hoping for. <laughs> I hope everybody really heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carl is staying with you, and we'll talk about another key element of German emails. So, while we're in agreement that double opt-in isn't a legal requirement, 
one thing that is, is the Impressum statement. Now, I think a lot of our listeners won't necessarily be familiar with an Impressum. So firstly, can you just give us a quick explanation of what is it and what are the key elements that form it? Yes, of course. So usually, basically, uh, in, the, in the footer uh, section of the email, you are obliged to reflect different information related to the company or the service you may provide. This may differ depending on the market, industry, or even company size where you operate. But usually in the, in the European, German space, customers are used to very long footers or impression links to their different landing pages where a lot of different company details are provided. Just, just to name few company name, the address or of the company, a contact method. Usually this, this could be an email address or a CS contact possibility, depending on the country, also registration, tax numbers appear as well. So basically all these company related information that permits recipients of the email to understand who is the sender of this email? Who may I uh, be able to contact this organization for email, telephone number? It's something that I guess is a bit different uh, in different regions of the world, but it's, it's quite standard here in, in the German space. And you make a great point because although it's a legal requirement, it's also a great best practice. I mean, you know, it's really, really good for senders in terms of transparency, as you say, being very clear in terms of who you are and how you can be contacted if there's an issue. And transparency builds trust, which every sender aspires to achieve. But just developing this question a little bit, so I talked about attending the, the CSA Summit and there was a great presentation from their compliance team about some of the recent complaints that they've reviewed. And um, they showed one example of an impressive statement where the sender was very clearly a US sender sending to a marketing audience in Germany. And they were shown as an example of non-compliance because they were missing some of the key elements. And I asked the compliance team, was this a an intentional thing that they'd shown this as this example? You know, is it tougher for senders from outside of market who may be a little bit less familiar with the requirements? Would you agree with that? Do you think that maybe senders from outside of the region, you know, represent a disproportionate number of the senders who are likely to be less compliant with this requirement? Yes, really. They may not be that familiar with the different national and, and European regulations with this matter and, and different uh, best practices in the industry. So yeah, I do completely agree. Before we even have the next question, I have to say, Guy, that was the second story you've told about the CSA summit. And like, you caught me. I'm jealous. I wanted to go. Like, <laughs> drink really every time Guy story. mentions the CSA summit. <laughs> okay, okay. Carlos and Marcus would tell us that the beer in uh, Munich is far superior to that in Cologne. We'll save that for part two of this <laughs> this episode. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if, if it's better, but it, in Munich it's bigger. At, at least the quantity. <laughs> <laughs> And Marcus, I am going to send this next question your way. Like all EU countries, German marketing is governed by strict data protection laws like GDPR and e-privacy. And while these laws set a high bar, they've essentially codified best practices. So how do these regulations impact email marketing and improve the effectiveness of the actual email campaigns themselves? I mean, they, they definitely improve. We can already see that at the numbers. That's why I'm also going to focus on the, on the positive things that they do. But all the strict laws in place, there is an easy possibility to file complaints. Subscribers have a lot of trust upfront that their privacy, the data will be treated with care. And I think this is one, one very important thing, because if I sign up to, to an email program, I'm already thinking about, hmm, might they sell my email address? What is going to happen with my data? And if I know that is someone who really yeah, ensures that all of the of the local requirements, the GDPR regulation is being kept in mind, then I already can put some upfront trust in them, I would say. And that's an you get an easy way to get off the mailing list or even have all of your data that they store removed. So I think that people just have a better feeling with signing up to something that they know that they can take this, these rights for granted that they have. And one yeah, other benefit it has is with all of those requirements that you have, a lot of, I would say, fishy senders, they 
tend to not be aware of all of these requirements. So it's, it's easier to tell a proper email apart from, from a fishy one because of all of the requirements, because getting an impressive write for a proper sender is already sometimes tricky if they're not uh, familiar with the local laws. So it's definitely something that will be even harder for phishing and, and spammy senders. So this is also something that improves the effectiveness and the, the trustworthiness of, yeah, of proper senders, I would say. That's so interesting. That's something we don't often hear, right? Certainly we hear about the trust that is built, but we don't often hear about the way that that can weed out quote unquote, fishy senders, right? And in our initial discussion, when we were, you know, behind the scenes talking about this podcast episode, you provided an interesting example of one of your customers or maybe a couple of your customers who opted out of having tracking features by default. So they're turned off by default. Do you think that these regulations hinder or restrict any maybe ingenuity by email programs in the region? Yeah, I mean, the regulations are definitely some kind of a a double-edged sword because there's a lot of benefits, but the hardest part of getting an email program up and running is sometimes talking to the legal team of the company, getting sign-offs for the the programs. And uh, this is also where this this example came from because they said, hey, we can't track anything. So no opens, no clicks, nothing. And I could already see the the marketers wanting to to leave the room because they said, "How should we work with that?" So that's definitely something where where an overly caution cautionous approach can definitely negatively impact the email program. So you can't build any affinities to to even yeah build up a proper program or do it in a way that really fosters engagement because if you don't know anything about your audience, you can't really improve. Mm. So this is something where I wouldn't say it's the regulation per se, but it is how strict some people are with it or how how the combination of, of multiple legal requirements is then said, oh, let's take the most cautious way possible. This is what really hinders the really innovative programs because you are then set back to the time where I hope that it should be gone already with all of that batch and blast sent the same stuff to, to the entire audience and at least if I myself am considered if I get a bunch of email communication by the same sender, which is irrelevant to me. It's just one thing where I have the the suspicion that it goes out to everyone. I will start with deleting them and then at some point I will unsubscribe. So this definitely will restrict the, the email programs. Yeah, But if you have people who really care for, for also the marketing aspects, they are also going to properly try to understand what the regulation actually says and what you really have to do to not hinder the marketing team's efforts. I'm in full agreement with you, Marcus, and it feels kind of like the conversation we had back when Apple introduced MPP and it's, yeah, it felt tough, especially for legitimate senders, you know, where useful data points about their customers were being removed from them that they previously used to do a better job of email, but hey, say la vie. Danielle, you're going to hate me because we need to touch on the CSA one final time. I'm sorry. Just took my drink for ah. people. Who... <laughs> but, um, you know, it did occur to me that I've mentioned them a couple of times, but yeah, we may have a number of listeners who are not that familiar with who or what they are. So uh, you know, let's make the point. You know, this organization ensures that email sending platforms, in, especially in the Dash region, so not just individual senders, maintain compliance with a broad range of email best practices and standards and regulations. And some of our listeners may remember that a number of episodes ago, we had Sebastian Cliff, who's the technical lead at the CSA, to talk about the podcast. For the benefit of our audience that didn't hear that episode, Carlos, could you maybe share a few words with us about the importance for German senders of CSA compliance and the impact this has on email marketing practices in the German-speaking region and beyond. Yes, sir. I mean, in the end, it's, it's about maintaining high-quality email standards. In this case, the certification program goes hand in hand with ensuring these high-quality standards. So as a certified uh, sender, you apply yourself to, to maintain and monitor those standards. And of course, this has some benefits on the uh, lead side of things from different email providers. And yeah, that's that's basically high level the benefits of, of maintaining a clean infrastructure and, and following best practices. 
And over and above what we've already discussed, like we would just love to hear your opinion on what other factors email marketers in Germany might need to consider for successful email campaigns. So Marcus, maybe for you, beyond just regulatory compliance, what else ensures successful performance and positive engagement? Yeah, I mean, due to my technical background, I'll focus on some of the the technical success factors because this is also something that is often overlooked. And as I already mentioned briefly in the beginning, a solid IP strategy is something that can really set you apart, especially when operating worldwide. And this is something that doesn't have to do with legal requirements directly, but just with the way email programs are set up or can also be more or less uh, something that that comes with legal requirements because you adhere to them differently. As we already said, in the US, it's an entirely different picture. And this is something where you just have to have a look at what is your volume that you're uh, sending? What are you doing within certain markets? And based on that, you can yeah define a, a proper IP strategy and say, okay, we're going to separate all the German speaking markets, just as an example. They get a separate IP. And for other market markets, you can also group them where it makes sense. And therefore, you don't have any any negative impacts on, on your reputation, on your deliverability, just because some markets operate differently, which could be treated very negatively in some, some markets. So I'm convinced that it wouldn't hurt to roll out all of the measures like double opt-in globally. And I also encourage uh, clients to do so, to be honest, because the stricter approach is easier than having separate ones. But then definitely the, the IP strategy is one, one key, one key thing. And there's some other measures I would at least, yeah, name here in, in this podcast, even though I can't go into detail, but this is the, the foundation of everything. Because if you don't get that right, you won't even deliver properly to bigger providers. I would say for some, it's a hassle to, to implement. I think if you've done it once, you know what to do and you should also do it before sending the, the first email. It's the sender policy framework, domain keys authenticated mail, DMARC, so domain-based message authentication. And if you have a brand that stands out, where everybody knows your logo, then the brand indicators, so be me, how it's called. This is for me a no-brainer to implement something like that because you can only do it if you have the rights for the brand and you really stand out. And this is something I definitely consider must have. Some of them luckily are getting more and more required by email providers. Thanks, Google. Thanks, Yahoo, for giving <laughs> some, some more attention to that. Because I think with big players jumping on that, it's easier to convince people to, to implement that before starting the programs. And yeah, this is, this is definitely something from a technical perspective that needs to be there. Yeah, and to throw one additional thing in when it comes to a very unpopular thing, which is an unsubscribe, my mantra is make it easy to leave, but hard for subscribers to want that because of your great content. That's something, if you stick to that, I think you're set up for success or in the German market. Just preaching to the choir, I, appropriate IP segmentation, authentication and BIMI, easy to leave. We're with you, I think. Guy, I could speak for both of us there. Oh, for sure. I was just thinking, yeah, that should be everyone's mantra, you know, make it easy to leave, but hard to want to leave. You know, that almost encapsulates everything we talk about. What about you, Carlos? I feel like as an agency, you guys have a great perspective and maybe you have sort of one or two real life examples of great tactics or strategies you've seen your customers to use to achieve great email performance. Sure. Some, I will name some of the strategies that uh, we see being successful uh, in different clients across different industries. We will recommend a lot of putting a lot of focus in, in, in segmentation and, and looking at data. So know your audience segment your audience, personalize your content, in the end, make it relevant to your audience. Integrate also different sources of data to support your segmentation and your personalization strategy. This could be behavior data, engagement data, not necessarily only from the email, it could be from, from your web shop or different, different sources that you have available. This could be purchase data, different affinities from your client, and use this data to segment and to personalize your campaigns. Also, in terms of, of these best practices, we talk about engage subscribers on, on unsubscribes. Subscribers do also have a life cycle. Consider to 
uh, reduce our uh, email frequency to unengaged subscribers, implement different strategies to segment your audience based on the engagement level. Do not be afraid to, to run re-engagement campaigns where you openly ask your clients, is it still of your interest that you receive this newsletter? Maybe tell us more about your interests and preferences. Uh, and at some point also, uh, do not be afraid to basically lose some of your unengaged subscribers. You may decrease the size of your list, but it's not point in, in trying to reach out to clients that are longer gone during months or even years just because of the perception of losing some list reach. In this case, there's more, more to win, letting them go or just reducing the exposure to campaigns or, or just opting out than rather trying and trying. And also something that we see a lot of momentum is around AI. So consider integrating new technologies, not necessarily only AI, but do we use new technologies to prevent customer churn, to increase customer engagement, to determine the next best offer, next best product, something that we see a lot of in commerce. So put also a lot of focus on the technology side of things to optimize your campaigns. Never mind next best offer. I think you've kind of predicted my next best question. So stick with me for a moment because I think you know, where we wanted to finish up on was we all know that email is such an evolving landscape. And how do you foresee the, the future of email marketing for your customers and programs that you work with? I mean, you've touched on AI. You know, what do you think are going to be the next big developments and changes that are going to shape our world in the coming years? We broadly talk about it. I think still maintaining a trust, building a trust relationship with your customer will remain, will be will be the basis of, of everything, independently of how, how fancy your email program is, how technology, well, you're using technologies. The building this trust relationship, I think, will remain being the key, the key thing. I think it's also important to set the right expectations from the beginning with your audience. Be clear about your, your email program, what you have to offer. Make it easy to join the program, but as Marco said, also let them go. You may want to set some strategies in place to, to downgrade instead of how oh, oh, there are different options to do that, but let them go. I think this is always something to keep in mind. And I think there's an increasing awareness, at least here in the European region, about data privacy. Of why do companies want to know this about me? What, what they do with the data? Be transparent with your audiences. Explain them why you need, for example, to know more about their interests. Most clients are willing to share data if they do that with companies organizations, brands they trust, and they understand why they ask to serve the data. So if, if you're transparent about why you request data to your clients, if you are making good usage and of this data, and of course, follow different regulations to ensure that this data is secure and that customers can access to data, customers to access to share the data in order to have a, a more personalized and better experience. And also, I think something to keep maybe in mind for the future now that we're talking about AI, big data, a lot of things. Don't forget the personal touch of your brand, what makes you unique and different, because sometimes this makes also maybe the difference in your email campaigns. And yeah, that would be some of the, of the thoughts of what the near future. Marcus, you mentioned before, I think you thanked Gmail and Yahoo for pushing some, some marketers forward. Do you think? Gmail and Yahoo are going to continue to improve the email ecosystem? Or do you have anything to add in terms of why, what might be to come for the email landscape? They will definitely do so because it's also a necessity to improve. I mean, in the past, it was easy to just fake that you're the sender of, of a legit email because, I mean, if you're a bit tacky, you could just do whatever you wanted, send somebody emails where they thought they, it's from a different sender. At some point, it had to be become a requirement because with all of the the phishing going on and all the, the spammy content, it, it really is a problem and it needs to be something that's done. And it seems like pushing something to, to spam or putting in a bubble, hey, this doesn't seem to be uh, legit. There is an issue with the authentication. This just isn't enough to keep some people from clicking the bad links. So there needs to be some improvements in, in this direction and that's why I also think it was the right right push and there's going to be more to come definitely also, also in this direction. A second thing that I think we can't dismiss is, is artificial intelligence. I mean, everybody's talking about AI. 
everybody wants to use it. Many don't know how or what for. And even more of the ones that want to use it but don't know are afraid what this could mean for them from a regulatory perspective. Maybe this is also something which is uh, a speciality in the German market, because even if there's no clear regulation in place yet, we're already thinking about, Poo, can we really do that? Will that be a problem in the future? But yeah, I see it as a, as a great driver for more personalized communication, both from a segmentation and a content perspective. But what I foresee is that this also doesn't only bring benefits, but also a lot of problems because what we already see all over social media is posts where it already smells of chat GPT and not knowing what you're actually talking about. This can bring a huge problem and also yeah, ruin good engagement. So there also needs to be some regulation, in my opinion, be it internal company policies on how to use AI or maybe an, an AI act where it is at least defined for, for very sensitive industries, for example. Because if you just think uh, of, of pharmaceutical companies using AI to put out marketing material, that can go wrong pretty quickly. So there yeah. needs to be for sensitive areas, uh, definitely a regulation in place, but also internal policies because it can quickly ruin a great email program if you're just putting copy out of, uh, of chat GPT. We're starting to wrap up the episode now. I don't know about you, Guy, but Carlos or Marcus, I feel like we just got a crash course in best practices for email broadly, so succinctly. And Guy's last question took you into the future. And my question now, a closing question, is going to bring you into the past. So Marcus, maybe let's start with you. If you could time travel, and give your younger self one piece of email marketing advice, what would it be? Yeah, there's one thing that I would also give every customer every now and then, which is do the basics right, track and monitor your progress, and then evolve the program step by step. Because thinking of everything at the start and putting in the big thing and the perfect program, it just won't work. So really start with the basics and go from there. And how about you, Carlos? My re recommendation would be know your customer, know your data. I think this is the foundation of of many things and for sure of a good marketing campaign. Two very, very solid, good bits of advice, not just to your younger selves, but probably to most of our listeners too. Carlos and Marcus, it's been such a pleasure having the two of you join myself and Danielle on email after hours today. I think a really great conversation about yeah, a lot of practices which are either laws or very strong requirements in the world that you operate in, which are also best practices. And I think you've helped to explain to lots of our listeners why they should be doing them, regardless of whether they're a legal requirement or not, because they're good for your email programs. Anyway, that's it for today. Join us in two weeks' time. Bye for now. Be sure to tune in next time and hit subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And don't forget to visit senderscore.com for loads more great resources to help you become a stronger sender. To all you sleepless senders out there, thank you for joining us after hours and see you next time.